Welcome back to African American Conservatives, the soul of the conservative movement. Those are words I wasn't sure that we would ever hear again. I'm your host, Marie Strader, and we are back. It's been a little while, yet much has happened in our nation since we last spoke. I have witnessed the greatest presidential administration of a lifetime. And I'm not just saying that because I served on Black Voices for Trump, but because of promises made, promises kept, especially with respect to the Black community. Uh, those intervening years also wrought huge changes in my own life. Those kids that you used to hear me brag about, and I will still brag about them, that hasn't changed. They are now 24, 21, and 19. My oldest got his bachelor's degree at the ripe old age of 20. He is now a game designer. He works for the company that he interned with during high school. So he is an educational software game designer. My daughter just graduated with her certification in veterinary assisting. In fact, she graduated on a Friday and her very first paid day was the very next day at the clinical where she put in her at the clinic where she put in her clinical hours. And my youngest is taking a gap year-ish, uh, but he's also putting some time in with the family business with my husband. So, uh, and we made a big move and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so uh, what did I do with myself during that time? Well, in addition to serving on Black Voices for Trump, I worked for today's guest, handling his social media. I also served as part of his staff at the Republican Party of Texas and during his gubernatorial campaign. And to do that, I moved from a blue state to the best red state in the nation. So what are we hoping to accomplish with this reboot of ACONS? To answer that question, we have to go back to the origin of the founding of ACONS. It was always meant to be a place where Black conservatives could discuss issues uh, pertaining to the Black community. Not to be exclusionary, but uh, back then in 2009, the unemployment rate for uh, Blacks was uh, treble that of their white counterparts. And for Black teens, it was up to 40%. So those sorts of issues, and now in the aftermath of, of Roe v. Wade, uh, we've seen the murder of more Black children in the womb than was the entire Black population of the United States in 1961, the year today's guest was born. So while these are issues that all people care about, all conservatives care about, they do hit the black community a little bit differently, hence this program. So we plan to discuss these issues, tackle these issues through the guests that we bring you, through some of the commentary that we have, um, and there will be a wrap up at the end where you will meet the uh, elusive DK. He is real, he truly is real, and he's here today and you'll meet him, but first, a man who needs no introduction, but he's gonna get one anyway. When we knew that ACONS was returning to the airwaves, we had unanimous consensus that our first guest had to be the man joining us today. Lieutenant Colonel Alan B. West is a combat veteran, having served 22 years in the United States Army. As he is fond of saying, there is no expiration date on the oath of office he took. So he has since served the longest running constitutional republic in the, the world has ever known by first serving in the United States House of Representatives from Florida, then as chair of the Republican Party of Texas, a gubernatorial candidate for Texas, where he now resides, and is currently the executive director of the American Constitutional Rights Union, or ACRU. He has a new podcast, Steadfast and Loyal, a social media following of over 4 million, and an adorable grandson, Jackson, who is poised to overtake him online. But in addition to working with Alan for a number of years, I have to say my favorite title for him is that of friend. Welcome back to the show, Alan. 
It's good to be with you, Maria. Thank you so very much. And I cherish your friendship and uh, just welcome to Texas. You're a Texan now and uh, you live down there in the Colleen, Texas area, which was my final duty station right there in Fort Hood, Texas. So God bless. Well, thank you. You currently serve as executive director of the American Constitutional Rights Union. For those unfamiliar, what do they do and why is it so important, especially now? Well, the American Constitutional Rights Union is about 26, 27 years old. It was founded, uh, the founding board member was Ronald Reagan's attorney general, former attorney general, Edwin Meese, and Robert Carlson, who was also in the Reagan administration. And the real intent and purpose of the American Constitutional Rights Union is to be the counter. Uh, the contrast to the American Civil Liberties Union, which is a far more leftist organization. So we want to just stick to one thing, the Constitution, the constitutional rights, the Bill of Rights, all of the things that make us that, as you said in the introduction, the longest running constitutional republic that the world has ever known. Speaking of constitutional rights, including that of freedom of speech, we're seeing conservatives being throttled more and more on social media, facing encroaching big brotherism. We saw that recently with the permanent ban of the conservative page libs of TikTok. Uh, speaking of TikTok, they censored you for the crime of going viral with comments about the raid on Mar-a-Lago. What can be done from both a policy perspective and a practical one? Well, I think one of the things uh, from a policy perspective, the Republican Party should speak about this and address this as their platform if they uh, a, a, upon achieving a majority in the House and the Senate uh, with uh, the title and the restrictions. And uh, I forget the just forgot the exact number, but the uh, the thing that has the protections for a lot of these social media companies, because we should not have a White House that is coordinating with a private sector social media company, Twitter, to uh, you know suppress and censor of the speech and the voices and the expressions of American people. That's unconstitutional. And I think also, on the other hand from that, we need to have more conservatives that are out there banding together with their resources and creating more uh, conservative-based platforms where you don't see that censorship and you don't see uh, that fascist activity in nature. So I think from a policy perspective, perspective, the Republicans have to make this one of their uh, key tenets uh, because upon uh, taking a majority. And I think also from a private sector, we need to have more options out there for conservatives to make sure that their voices are heard. You recently noted the one year anniversary of the American withdrawal from Afghanistan by stating, well, we put back in power as the United States of America, the exact same people, the militant radical Islamists, the terrorists known as the Taliban, and now we're allowing them to thrive. All of the things that we worked so hard for, the rights, the freedoms and privileges, especially for women and little girls to be able to go to school, that's now gone in the twinkling of an eye, end quote. Would we have been better served by an indefinite continuing engagement in Afghanistan, a position advocated for by many Republicans, despite our apparent inability or unwillingness to eliminate the Taliban? Or was, the, or was it the way that we withdrew that created what you call a debacle? Well, the way that we withdrew was absolutely uncostable, <laughs> and it, it was a debacle from the strategic operational and tactical level. I think the thing that we have to understand is what is our strategic goal and objective? And and uh, no one really talked about that. It wasn't just to go in there and uh, make sure that Osama bin Laden was killed and we got rid of Al Qaeda. The intent should have been to make sure that Afghanistan can never be used as a base of operation for the launching of Islamic terrorist uh, operations, jihadist operations. And so what we did by allowing the exact same people who brought Al Qaeda in in the first place to be put right back in power. And oh, by the way, look what happened. We just recently had a drone strike and uh, quote unquote kill Ahmad Zawahiri, who was the number one guy of Al Qaeda. So obviously, we did not achieve that strategic objective. So the thing that we should have done, and with a small force of, you know, probably less than 5,000. We could have made sure that we maintain uh, the, the cleansing of Afghanistan from being used as a terrorist base and a terrorist sanctuary. Uh, the fact that we left $80 billion of military equipment 
which basically enabled the Taliban overnight to become, I think, the 22nd or 23rd largest air force in the in the world. That's that's unbelievable. The fact that 13 Americans lost their lives there because they were put in a strategically and, uh, and tactically untenable position there at the uh, Hamid Karzai International Airport, a place that I know very well since I spent two and a half years in Afghanistan. No one has been held accountable. No one has been held accountable for that abhorrent decision. So now we see that Al Qaeda is right back in there being hosted by the Taliban since we put the same people back in charge. The Haqqani Network is part of the uh, new Afghanistan Taliban uh, government. And we also know that ISIS has a footprint now in Afghanistan as well. So this was a very dumb decision. Absolutely. Um, and I was going to follow up with the, the drone strike, but you covered that. So we'll go on to the next one. Uh, Myra Flores flipped Texas's CD34 and mm -hmm. became the first Mexican born Congresswoman. As someone who is uh, the former chair of the uh, Republican Party of Texas and was the first black congressman from Florida since Reconstruction. What are your thoughts on the GOP's engagement with candidates like Representative Flores uh, and others, both uh, Texas and nationally? Well, that was one of the things that I wanted to focus on, as you well know, Marie, because you were part of our social media and communications uh, wing for the Republican Party of Texas. Uh, in 2020, it wasn't about chasing the left and going into the suburbs. You know, I wanted to say, let's go and engage where the uh, where the, the left thinks they're strongest, down the Rio Grande Valley in the urban population centers, and let's counter their message there. Let's go on offense and not defense. And I remember meeting with Myra Flores when she was just a, a local activist down there in South Texas and saying, yes, if you have it within your heart to run for Congress, you should run for Congress. And look, now she's a member of Congress, and I think she'll still win that seat coming up in November. And I think that Monica De La Cruz Hernandez will win her race and we may pick up another seat uh, with a Hispanic female down there. Why? Because when you're engaged with people and you talk about the commonality of principles and values, not just you know showing up right before an election, uh, that's outreach. Uh, I want to see more of that engagement. And that's what we were successful in doing is bringing to the Hispanic community in South Texas these issues and letting them know that you, you, you believe in the Judeo-Christian faith here. You believe in strong families, better economic and education opportunities for your children. You don't want to see open borders because you know about the crime and criminality that comes along with that. And you believe in service to our country and you believe in free market enterprise that allows you to have your great success of small businesses. And when you talk in those terms, that policy engagement, those principle engagement, the value engagement, then you win people over to your side. And that would be my message to the Republican Party uh, all across the United States of America. You recently posted about the murder of Coach Michael Hickman saying mm -hmm. the major issue facing the black community in America today, it has nothing to do with white supremacy or white police officers. The preeminent issue is black on black violence, end quote. Practically speaking, how do we as a community begin that dialogue and process, given how factionalized we are? Well, first of all, we got to reject these insidious organizations like a Black Lives Matter, because, you know, which Black Lives Matter to them? Only the lives that they can use for political uh, advancement, because no one's talking about Michael Hickman. I mean, here is a, a model citizen in South Dallas, Lancaster, Texas, uh, was a running back at the University of North Texas. He was a little league football coach and a little league football coach gets shot in front of his nine year old son at a practice scrimmage. You got to be kidding me. I mean, this should be front page all over the place. This should be something that outrages every single person in the black community from from Lancaster, Texas, uh, across the country. But yet you're not hearing anything about it. ESPN is not talking about it. And what's even worse, Marie, is that Michael Hickman's sister, who was a star athlete at Texas Southern University, a PE coach, a year prior, she was shot and killed. So here is a family that had fine, upstanding individuals that had athletic careers that were giving back to their community. They're dead. 
And think about the, the, the scarring on that nine-year-old son who saw his father, his football coach, shot to death right in front of him. And when you look at the Tlaib brothers, one of whom was a, a former NFL player who has a serious uh, criminal history, this is the issue that we need to be talking about, the black-on-black -black crime, the fatherlessness that is out there, the lack of discipline, the fact that people are going to get so upset about a you know Pop Warner football scrimmage game that they're going to take out a gun and shoot someone over that. You know, we, we have got to do better in our community because we are the ones that are killing ourselves off. Not just the fact that we're murdering our unborn in the womb, we're killing ourselves every single day. We've been stuck on 12 to 13 percent of the population in the United States of America for quite some time. And that should be something that really concerns people in the black community. So you would use that maybe as a jumping off point to start talking about some of these issues within our community. Mm -hmm. Well, just not that. I, I think that this should be the, the, the high point of saying, come on. I mean, we see it every single weekend in Chicago, Detroit, Washington, D.C., you know, Dallas, Atlanta, you know, all the major urban population centers. But when you read about this story of a, a, a fine, upstanding person that's a little league football coach that is gunned down in front of his nine-year-old son over a football scrimmage, that's what we call a timeout on the field. And we stop listening to these, you know, partisan ideologue voices like the, the avowed Marxists of Black Lives Matter and start talking about all the Black lives that must matter, all the lives, period, that should matter. People know you as a military man. Uh, they know you as a serious guy. They don't really know the side of you that I know. Um, <laughs> and no one brings that out better than one Jackson Bernard Durton. So I just wanted to ask you about your grandson. What dimension has being a grandparent brought to your life and Angela's life? Yeah. Well, you can see right over my shoulder there, uh, that's the picture of uh, me and Jackson. And he's just a joy. Uh, you know, being a parent is one thing. Being a grandparent is something completely different because now you're talking about that future generation. And when I look at this country, when I look at all the hopes and aspirations and dreams I have for him, that's why I fight so hard. And he just is it, just a joy for all of us. And to, to be able to, you know, have a nighttime pool time with him and let him get out there and, and blow bubbles. And he's starting to learn how to kick and, and get around in the pool very well at just 15 months. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. Now, he's a little mischievous rascal as well. But. <laughs> I love him to death. And I think that he has really taken my love of this country to another level because this is my part of my legacy that I'll pass on. If you're just joining us, our guest today has been Lieutenant Colonel Alan West. Alan, we thank you for being with us today. You've got a new podcast, Steadfast and Loyal. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that and tell us where we can find it online. Well, the Steadfast and Law, you know, Spotify, YouTube, all those, uh, you know, places. It's so important that we inform, educate, and activate people to be better citizens in this constitutional republic. Uh, I don't want to be a subject. But when you are, you know, basically keeping yourself in the dark and you are being deceived, you, you will become a subject. You'll be led around by your nose. And so what we want to do is to bring to you critical topics, critical uh, thinkers that are out there that can inspire you, but put the information in your kit bag, kit bag so that you can go out there and make the right decisions as far as the local, state, and federal elected uh, positions that you are voting for, because that's what we really need to have happen. I think that a lot of people are learning when you look at our school board races, how important they are. And you know, you've heard me say many times, the most important elected position in the United States of America is school board. Now we know why. So we want to continue to educate, inform, and activate people and elevate their cognizance of a lot of things that are going on. So it's all about sharing thoughts, perspectives, and insights. I'll be very honest, it's from a Christian constitutional conservative perspective. And why is that? Because that's the foundation of this constitutional republic. Excellent. Thank you so much for being our guest today. My pleasure. My pleasure. And it's so great to have African-American conservatives back. You know, you and I go back probably about 12 or 13 years. And uh, this is just a powerful platform. And I'm glad to see it back. Well, thank you. Appreciate it very much. And thanks for being our first guest. 
You got it. God bless. Take care, Marie. Take care. So now we're going to deconstruct a little bit of that conversation with DK, who is my co-blogger, co-founder of African American Conservatives. He is the passion behind our uh, Facebook uh, discussions and uh, a Twitterer extraordinaire. So uh, DK, come on in and let's uh, chat for a little bit. <laughs> How are you? Batman gear. <laughs> that was a great interview. Well, thank you. Thank you. We tend to have some pretty good collaborations. So for those of you who have not met DK, he is really, truly the brilliance behind Acons. He does a lot of the research, does a lot of the booking of the guests. So uh, he is, he is, you may see my face, but it really is his hard work that, that is the uh, thrust behind this show. So in this reconstituted version of Acons, it was really important to me to highlight his work because uh, he is just as much Acons as I am, uh, as Sebastian is. So it's it's good to see you, my friend. Well, thank you for that. But I'm I'm not the brilliance behind Acons, but it's good to confirm that I'm really black. So I know we get that coming a lot. <laughs> I know a lot of times you feel like, are you people even black? That's a question. <laughs> you can't be black. <laughs> Is it run by black people? All I see are white avatars. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of an inside joke, but I mean, it really does happen a lot. On, yeah, on, we're really black. Yeah, it really is crazy. So you know, in hearing um, Colonel West talk about black on black violence and some of the stuff in our community, how do we kickstart that 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 conversation, DK? It was good to see him. Um be one of the few people willing to highlight black on black violence. I mean, I looked up some numbers uh, since I figured we might discuss this and I've, I've seen that 51% of the people murdered for, 51% uh, of the people arrested for murder are black, 27% of the people arrested for rape are black and 33% of the people arrested for robberies are black. And keep in mind, we're only 13% of the population, so you can tell there's an epidemic on Black violence. And the, probably the most scary stat of all is that 55% of the murder victims in this country are also Black. So we go with 13% of the population, we're 55% of the murder victims. So that's a tragedy. And like Wes said, you could combine that with abortion, and we're killing ourselves. So the answer is that we tell people, stop using guns, stop doing bad things because they'll listen, right? I mean, they'll obey a posted sign that says, you know, don't do this or don't shoplift or don't do whatever. That hasn't worked. You know, um, gun control, the city of Chicago probably has, uh, or the state of Illinois has probably some of the most restrictive gun laws in the country, but that hasn't stopped the violence in Chicago. So how do we begin to police ourselves and hold ourselves to a higher standard? Because, you know, back in, you know, oh, many, many, many years ago before you and I were born, even people who had two and three jobs would come home. They would check their kids' homework. They were very engaged, very involved parents. But we've seen that shift, right? Um, as uh, Alan says, that it started with LBJ and the Great Society program. Fathers were taken out of the home, and we've seen what the consequence of that is. So how do we begin to, to uh, parse that out and, and, and restore and heal our community? Well, first we have to recognize that the problem we're facing is, is primarily cultural. And I found another stat that really high, highlights that. While I mentioned that 51% um, of the people arrested for murder are black, I looked up Asians. Asians are 6% of the population, not 14 like we are, but only 1% of the murderers arrested are Asian. So 6% of the population, 1% of the people murdered for, arrested for murder are Asian. So that really highlights what a cultural problem we're having. And that is exactly why Acons is back. So tune in next time. We'll have another great guest. We'll have some more conversation with DK. And this is African American Conservatives 
the soul of the conservative movement, coming to you from the Bright News Network. I'm Marie Strotter, signing off, and DK, see you <laughs> next time. Adios.